Hello, hi, assalamu alaikum wagwan. Um, it's Ali Hazina, and we're back with day five at um, the Re Festival as part of the Department of Dreams with Civic Square. Um, today's conversation I'm very, very excited for um, is with the incredible, um, just a absolute real one, um, Suzanne Alien, who is going to be talking to us about the neurology of power. Um, Ooh, we'll be joined a little bit later by Dr. Joy Jones, um, who will be in conversation with Suzanne and who Suzanne's been doing a little bit of work with. But just to introduce the incredible um, person I am about to be in conversation with, Suzanne Elian is a cultural thinker, neurodiverse um, female leader, aged 54, collaborative working, creating equitable space for all is at the heart of everything she does. She is driven by the belief that considering people, profit and purpose at all levels of business benefits both organisations and wider society. Her portfolio of clients have included Barclay Cards, Channel 4, v &A, Welcome Trust and Roundhouse. Within the arts, she has an impressive track record working with the UK's writers and poets on their professional development and associated shows. She is an inaugural Arts Council England change maker through which she was commercial brand and strategy director at Apples and Snakes where I met Suzanne. Um, she is a fellow at the RSA, a cultural animator um, or for signifier and um, a visiting research associate and guest lecturer at King's College London. One time for Suzanne. Pew, 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 pew. How are you? How are you doing today? Oh, seeing your face is absolutely gorgeous. It's oh, made me happy. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, so it, it will be a little bit of like an informal conversation today. Um, and you, I know you've got some slides to share and some of your work around the neurology of power. I remember the first time like you spoke to me and you just used this term and I was like, the neurology of power. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into a lot of that a little bit later, but I just wanted to ask, you describe yourself as a cultural thinker. Um, what What is that and what does that mean? So the reason that, uh, that no one's heard of it is because I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like, doing that kind of thing where there was nothing that existed that described what I was trying to do. And I'm a great believer, if it doesn't exist, do it for yourself. So it is someone for me, it means that I look at kind of society's big problems and I think about how I might find um, at least a contribution to a solution using um, thinking about root cause, which is how neurology of power comes in. Because for me, a root cause um, to discrimination, prejudice, lack of diversity, lack of inclusion, all of that, I think that the thing that no one is really talking about, as if it's a taboo topic, is power. So as a cultural thinker, I, I, I look at that, I think about it because I'm dyslexic, I tend to find a gap in the market. And then for me, being a cultural thinker is about being collaborative as well. So, you know, we, we guys work together together um we then talk to audiences we ask them about our research and then kind of working iteratively which is like the poshest word i know so what i really mean is like we, we do something we have a look at it does it work does it not we reconfigure it and we keep moving forward does that explain it 100 percent. so the importance of the process and the um re-evaluation and that continuing in order to um, understand the context that we're currently in, but also create something that is a little bit more robust than what we currently have. Um, I think that's that's crucial in order for us to move forward. Um, so you talk quite a lot about working collaboratively, and I think even within that like iteration phase of the things that you've just spoke about, collaboration is completely key in the way um, that you work. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and your practice and what you do? Yeah, so, I mean, the truth of the matter is that you can see the colour of my skin and you can um, you can make some assumptions about gender. But the reality is that, you know, I have significant mental health diagnoses, I have dyslexia, um, I have an interesting background. But when all of that comes together, what it means is that I, I just work well with people. Nothing I ever do is brilliant if I do it on my own. And so working collaboratively 
is about including everybody and not including them at the end. So it's not about, I don't know, you know, you're going out to a party and you're going with your friends and you, you ring them at the very last minute when you spent all day putting on the eyelashes and the shoes. And then just as you're running out the door, you're like, oh yeah, here's the dress code. That doesn't help anyone, right? So when I relate it to work, it's about now. Like I'm at my research stage of what I'm doing and I'm making sure I'm talking to everyone. So I'm doing a symposium at the Barbican, but I'm going to go and talk, you know, in my life I had a very small stint of being homeless. It, it was it was it was short compared to others, but it means I have access to those networks. I want to talk to everybody about what power means to them because you throw it all in the melting pot at the beginning and you walk along the road with people and you get something way better. Collaboration will always be better than singular. Mm. And also a way of like bringing it back to the idea of power for us to be empowered together and like the movement of power is a dynamic that is continually shifting in the current climate that we're seeing but also when more of us come together there's that collective power as well I just wanted to um ask when you talk about power more generally before we get into the specifics of the neurology of it um what is your like not only like a personal definition but what is power to you so you know about four years ago I did a master's and I I was completely fresh to academia I hadn't done an undergrad you know I, I bailed out in my sixth form and um, so this whole idea of academic definitions are really interesting and definitions per se mm. the way that I'm thinking about power for the purpose of this is not just about um, how you define power but who is able to exert or wield influence or make decisions over a group of people with or without with or without their agreement mm. and so you know anyone who's watching this that knows me will laugh at the next sentence right i'm from croydon god bless croydon please i hope i haven't offended anyone but what i mean by that is i'm glad i did my masters but if everything i'm talking about doesn't make sense to me on a real level, then it's really pointless. So I would encourage people to think about what power means to them. Um, and I was going to uh, bring it up later, but if you give me a second, there is an amazing, amazing quote. It's attributed to, um, to Alice Walker. But, you know, as an academic, I had to do my due diligence and see if I could find it, and I can't, but either which way. So it says the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. Oof. And I think it's really easy, that one heard it. Yeah, it's really easy, isn't it, in this moment to feel like we don't have power. Um, so I, I don't know. Does that? Does yeah, one hundred percent. And I think those are some of the things that we would we've been talking about and weaving through this festival as well. The idea of power and powerlessness. Um, and I think there's a lyric from Akala, it's like absolute power corrupts absolutely, but absolute powerlessness does the same. Um, I'm just looking at, I, it's, it's, it's such a thin line to say that like power is in the mind, especially when we come from like economically, socially, um, like devastated areas because of the use of power that has been that has corrupted where we're from. Um, but the idea that we have no power is something that, again, comes historically from those who have corrupted what we view as power. Um, and so I think there's something really, really powerful in that sentence by Alice. Um, and also something that feels very like urgent for how we're trying to move forward. Um, I just wonder before we like move on to some more questions, if you had any reflections on what you've seen in the like last couple um weeks or months with regards to power shifts and dynamics well you know the funniest thing about the work that i'm doing and, and you know this more than anyone else mm. i started this maybe three or four years ago i well i never expected to be where we are right now not just with um c19 but with um black lives matters um with world events and when I first started this research, it, it was really about 
um, the area that I work in, arts and culture, mm -hmm. and more specifically the fact that I work in publicly funded arts and culture. And for those that don't know, that means your money is paying for all of the big institutions and they should be reflecting you. And so my thing, you know, as a leader was that I was often the only person. And so for me at that point, that's why I started Neurology of Power. Now, move forward a few years and all of a sudden that, that research has broadened because now within coronavirus, we are, I'm very much considering as part of that research, what does power mean to us individually? What does power mean if you're on lockdown? Um, what does power mean in the concept and concepts of racism? Mm -hmm. What does power mean in terms of what we what we are trying to achieve as a society? And so I think um, hopefully we will get joy on with us soon. But certainly there's some really interesting research around power, the brain, racism, how it affects the brain. Um, there is some, and, and, and I say this all to say I'm not a neuroscientist. What I'm doing is kind of like, I, I kind of sit in the center and just reach out my tentacles. And then what I'm really good at doing is putting it all together. But we definitely need to be thinking about um, the biological impacts of what's going on in our brain at this moment. And, and it's not, it's not for me just about the black and brown communities, although for me that's extraordinarily important. And I and I would hope people seeing our experiences right now would understand why. But actually, I think C19 has um, taught us that we are all joined at the ankle in this world. And for me, the biggest thing about my research is that if, if we don't move together well, no one's moving at all. Mm. 100%, I just wanna amplify that um, notion. And also something you just said with regards to like where we're at now informing how much nuanced and how deeper the research we're doing is now. So it's not just about the, it's about it's not just about how power is held in these institutions in these spaces which is where you may have been a couple of years ago but now it's more like the personal power and how we mm. all define that um and I, I just can't wait to read whatever comes out of this um but i did want us to bring it back to the term um and just a little and just find out a little bit more about that journey how did you get to the neurology of power so um just going back a little bit and bear with me mm. i i i've been working in the cultural sector and actually i've done very very well in the commercial sector but i wanted to work in the cultural sector because i i met some amazing poets so uh, a little shout out to malika booker and roger robinson who were the who were the people that i met and and they were they were they were super young and of course still super fly but i knew their work was important move forward a few years and I really struggled in the sector. Every time I went to do work, it didn't matter how much we sold out. It didn't matter how strategic we were. We were always positioned in that diversity box. And, and being as though that I'd come from the commercial sector where I didn't have that, that was not my norm, right? Mm. And eventually I went to university and I learned what academia does. But I also learned being the only uh, black person in a cohort of 90 that I looked at things in a different way. Um, and I started to think about, um, I started to think like I'm 54. I've been around the sun many times. The Race Relations Act was in 65. How are we still here with, you know, there is no great words, but diversity and inclusion, how are we still here on representation? Mm -hmm. And essentially, uh, four things happened very quickly. I finished my research. I did, a, anyone who knows, like I've got a massive grant to kind of, elevate my my leadership skills while I was doing that I started to read a bit and I realized that in all of my academic reading no one talked about power and it was like a light bulb moment I was just like hang on a minute how can you be talking about structural changes and you're not thinking about power and then I read this pop piece 
Um, so pop science is kind of like, you know, you might read it in, sorry, cosmopolitan. It's where someone's taken the essence of something from academia, but they've kind of slightly sensationalized it. And so this headline said that power damages the brain. So that was like my second stake. And my first stake was that I thought, wow, so if it damages the brain, which I was a bit, you know, I was a bit suspicious of in terms of it just being a general statement. Um, I knew I could track back and I found the neuroscientist whose paper it was, which isn't quite what he said. What he said was it, it changes the brain's makeup sometimes. Mm. I started to think, well, what happens if in the art sector, with all due respect, the majority of the leaders are white middle class men, right? So I thought, well, what happens if you're them and you just keep seeing yourself all the time? What happens with the power in your brain? Where does power reside? Is it like memory that it sits in different places? Mm. So I start to think about um, if you have it and you want more and you see people who've got it and they look like you, what happens? But conversely, if you don't have it and you don't see yourself, what's going on? So, and the final bit really was, um, well, back to Malika Booker, who uh, has always done affirmations. And to be honest, before I kind of stepped onto the more artist side, I was like, you're bonkers, love. What are you doing? <laughs> well, I like affirmations. But now we know that that really does change the makeup of your brain. And so all of that came together. And I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this research. I'm going to think about where power resides in the brain. But I'm also going to think about who's doing that work. If I read a paper, what lens are they seeing it through? Are they seeing it through a lens of potentially being... Uh, racist are they seeing it through a lens of their belief system um so i've been doing that and i called it neurology of power um i never want to do something that people look at the title and want to go to sleep so for me my sense check is would i put it on a hoodie <laughs> it's a pretty good sense check to be honest i would wear a neurology of power hoodie yeah so that's that's how i came to it I think that's it's such a like beautiful timeline and then also as you mentioned a little bit earlier how some of that initial timeline has now shifted so that the personal power also comes in and um through your collaborative learning a lot more of that work is able to be um put into the thinking and whatever the outcome of this project um and research is um you've mentioned around like being interested in like equality for everyone um I guess I'd, my question is what can the brain tell us about power from a neuroscience perspective and I know you've already said that like you're not a neuroscientist and you alluded to some of it a little bit earlier um so um so what I'm let me tell you what I'm doing at the moment so Research around power on the brain is actually mad new. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it and it largely sits under two two areas called cultural neuroscience and human science, human neuroscience. So, this the work that I'm doing is so ahead of the game. It's ahead of, in part, what neuroscientists are able to tell us. And mm -hmm. so, part of what I'm doing at the moment, and it's taken quite a while, is I'm literally having to look around the world and gather cultural neuroscientists and ask them questions. So, and it's all relational. So I will be talking to one neuroscientist who's literally looking at power um, and he's based in Canada. But then I'm talking to other neuroscientists who are more looking at power and morals or power and racism. And then I'm having to take what that person said and what that person said. And then, so I'm collating it. I'm just collating everything that exists but but I guess something that is really, really interesting is that at the moment, neuroscience can use magnetic pulses to show your brain creating empathy. Mm. Right. And then and then research shows that those with more power neurologically show less empathy. And of course, then the more power you have potentially the less empathy now the thing about this particular piece of research it was done by someone who i feel sees it through a very good lens in terms of humanity 
uh, ethics, values, morals, um, ethnicity. And what he says is that that this that the shows don't consistently show this happens. So it'd be really wrong for me to say that it does. And of course, that's why for me, this is quite an interesting space to be because I can't just go and look at those headlines which says power damages the brain. I actually have to go back and back and back and, and then find the neuroscientists and then go and talk to them. But what but what it but the way the research is going at the moment is is that it shows that empathy and power are linked and that the more power you have, the less empathy you may have. Um, and again, just for the purposes of the tape and those at home, not always. Mm, and I guess for like that conversation or just like the outline of that, that your empathy decreases if you have more power. Um, and again, this has nothing to do with the research, but I'm just interested in what your personal opinion is of why that might happen and how we, whether that's just from the interactions of things that we've seen when being in these spaces um, or through interacting with people who have power and who believe to, of themselves to be powerless. Um, why do you think that is the case when it comes to there being more of a correlation towards lacking empathy when you are in a position of power? So I think what I can say is this, that, um, I mean, you know, cause I call you, so keeping it maybe a little too real for everyone, I will ring and be like, oh, you're one of them, I'm not a neuroscientist. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then we go back and we have conversations and we eat raw chocolate cake and we drink green juice and then and then and then I come back to this point that actually I have a different lived experience and what I'm trying to do is balance science and sometimes you have to ask what is science mm. with the value of lived experience and also the value of different traditions so I've just learned um, from one of our team members about um, about the Yoruba nation and how uh, part of the, the value and belief system around that is about collectivity. And, um, and so when you say to me, what are my beliefs, then personally, that's not my culture. But what I've learned from that is that I believe that we're all interconnected. I also have a really probably a, a different belief to that of most of the global north or the west. The way that I've lived my life, as best as I can and not all the time, is that I believe that power is this kind of, in one way, this mystical kind of gassy, you can't quite hold on to it. But I do believe that if you give it away, mm. your power increases and everyone else's power increases. Whereas I think, really in western society power is about something that you have over people mm. and power is about the more people you have power over the greater your own power is so if i sort of bring that in you know i, I kind of like this idea of there's me with many hats i kind of bounce into it and i'm like well what do the academics say and then i bounce out of it and i go well, how do i feel and then i go and i talk to um you know to to, to different audiences and they say, well, this is how we feel about power. I'm working with um, the Banff Centre for Creativity and Arts, I think they're called, in Calgary. And they're, they're about leadership through wise practice. And so if you really look at what First Nations and Indigenous um, communities and nations have to say about power, it's entirely different. Mm. They, they view power, they see power, they have this whole idea of, of interactivity so that the, the elders and the youngers, all of those views are valued and they all have power. Mm. So I think what I'd like to do ultimately is bring together that scientific fact and and bring it together with what lived, lived experiences are. Amazing. And I, I'm so happy you like, touched up on like the indigenous cultures because from the way that we're describing the hoarding of power, for me, there's a direct link to the coloniality of it and the like colonial project that 
told the rest of the world that this is how we should view power. But then if we yeah. look at our relationship to power and being empowered from more of like an indigenous stance, then a lot of the fear and the uncomfortability of our own power sort of begins to reside because we realize that whilst we are very important as as like individuals, we're also even more important together and in that like communion. We've got Michaela in the background. So hi Michaela. Hello everyone. <laughs> Who is holding up Dr. Joy Jones. Um, Dr. Joy Jones is a physician, musician, anthropologist and activist. Um, and she's joining us as well. Um, she's a board certified family um, medicine physician. She focuses on optimizing the physical health uh, of disenfranchised communities in need. Um, and Suzanne's been doing a little bit of work with her on the neurology of power. Um, so welcome, welcome into the chat. Suzanne, over to you. Oh, Joy, I'm so glad we got this text sorted. Michaela, thank you. Um, for anyone who can see Michaela's wonderful arms, Michaela's part of our team and just holds the tech that all of us together couldn't do. So Joy, welcome, welcome. welcome. So you know what, we're going to kick off with some easy stuff. Joy, tell us a bit about yourself, um, what you do and how you became involved and why. Okay. Well, uh, as she said, my name is Dr. Joy Jones. Uh, I've grown up really always being in that space between arts and science, sciences. I've been an artist and I've always been interested in medicine. I come from a, a family of, of physicians. Um, and my own personal journey led me in a roundabout way through medicine. Um, was in London studying medical anthropology, then uh, went into public health, and then eventually found my way into medicine just because I was trying to find my own calling. Um, but my particular interest in medicine has always been both general medicine and then emotional medicine, so psychiatry, um, partly because I'm very interested in the holistic person. Um, and so while I finished and I'm board certified in family medicine, I have now gone back to UCLA to finish my training in psychiatry so that I can do both. Uh, and so really the interesting aspect, I was so excited when Suzanne told me about her interest in uh, neurology and in power because I am very interested in, I guess what we would call disenfranchised populations, people who are on the outskirts of society who are often maybe considered to be minorities or, you know, for whatever reason, don't seem to fit into um, society as it were. And power has so much to play um, in this, in the reason why they're there and how they react to that and how they're treated. So I was really interested to be part of this project. So, uh, so uh, Joy and I spend quite a lot of time. Um, she consults and actually the thing that's most interesting at the very beginning of our conversations is how little well i don't know about the audience but how little i know about the brain um and i'm also really interested in how little we as human beings are interested in our brain and power so just to kind of give people a quick example when i started talking to my friends about power they were like yeah whatever and then I was just like, but what about the power you have with your friends? What about the power you have over your child? What about the power in the workplace? What about structural structural issues around power? Like, surely this is the great taboo word of this century, right? And when I started to work with with, with Joy, uh, we we had a very we had a very funny couple of weeks where Joy is just trying to get me to understand some of the basics of how the brain work and. For me, I'm like the lowest common denominator. If I get it, trust me, everyone else can get it. So at the moment, what, what I'd really like to kind of ask Joy is about some basics, really. So we've got a, a rather cute picture of the brain, and I'm just going to ask Joy to just tell us, like, where's the brain stem and what does it do? Where's the frontal cortex? And my favourite word, where's the amygdala? Um, and, and, and the reason we're all laughing is that... that I can only just about say that word now. So I'm gonna share the screen and an amazing feat of tech, you should see a beautiful image of the brain. 
Joy, take us through that just very simply in like real layman's terms, just pick two or three areas and then I'll use a separate image for the amygdala. Okay, so what you're seeing, starting from the bottom, this yellow kind of, um, I guess, kind of tube or funnel going into the brain, that is your brain stem. So that is really what controls all of our involuntary functions like it that's what keeps your heart beating regularly so you don't have to think beat beat okay the heart beat beat or your eyes blinking every so often to keep your eyes um, moisturized or even your breathing so really if anything happens to that you will likely die because that is keeping that is really keeping you alive so the brain is always at all costs, really trying to maintain that portion of the brain. When you start looking at, um, let's see, that little red kind of triangular part behind there, um, that's the cerebellum. That's what we use for kind of fine motor action and for balance. Um, that's what allows you to walk in a straight line. That's also what's affected if you drink a little too much and you can't walk in a straight line. Um, but I think what we have been talking about more often has been the uh, cerebrum. So when you're looking at the brain, you see these like the blue area, the green area, and the purple area, and it's all kind of like wrinkly. Um, so that is really where the majority of our integration of information happens. Um, the frontal area, which is the, the blue area right there, that's what we use for reason and higher function. Um, expressive language, personality is housed there. Um, the green middle part, the parietal region, uh, that's the part we use for kind of like for sensation. That's how we can appreciate if something, uh, if we need to push harder when we're trying to open the door or, you know, it's, it, it kind of helps us to feel and to sense touch. And then uh, this purple area in the back is the occipital area, and that is what we use for visual uh, function. So the eyes are actually feeding back to the back of your brain, and so that's what allows us to see things. And then what you, you can't really see, but really on the side of the brain would be the temporal region. And so that's the area that is uh, most used for uh, hearing and auditory functions, right? If you would think of your own head, it's right next to your ear. So that makes sense that the information would go in there and be processed in that area. In the front part of the temporal region, um, that's where we will actually find uh, the limbic system or the amygdala. Um, the limbic system is much bigger than the amygdala, but um, in particular, Suzanne has been really interested in the amygdala because it's this little tiny, oh yeah, you can see it on that picture there. It's a little tiny kind of almond shaped um, part of the brain, but it does so much. Uh, the amygdala is really what we use to scan our environments and to determine whether it's a safe place for us. So it is partially concerned about keeping you safe. Um, but in doing that, it is also determining what should be the response to threat. You know, um, it is where we house emotions like fear and sadness and um, aggression and anger. Um, and it's really part of our kind of fight or flight uh, response. Now, this is very, really just a very simplistic view of the brain. I mean, there's so much more going on with the brain, of course. I mean, all of these parts are working together. The amygdala is very is, is linked to the hippocampus, which is where uh, which is really useful for our memory. So that makes sense that. You know, if you're scanning the environment, your brain is also, your amygdala is saying, okay, let me talk to the hippocampus. Uh, is this something we've seen before? Is this something we should be afraid of? You know, and so when we're talking about the neurology of power, these are all of the things that are at play for, for somebody. And this will determine, like, how powerful they see themselves in a particular situation. Um, that will then feed into self-esteem and motivation and resilience and just all of the things that we know make somebody kind of self-actualized or not. Thank you for that whistle-stop tour around our brain. 
um, in one of the most beautiful images that I've seen, and I'm very visual, so I hope people found that as interesting as I did. Um, I want to hand back to Alia, and I think maybe it would be interesting to think about, you know, what else we might know or, or what else neuroscience might be telling us. So back over to you, Alia. So a big, big up to Michaela and also, and your arm, and um, Dr. Joy for joining us because we are also in the midst of a pandemic. So we really, really appreciate you taking time out from being on call as a doctor um, to come and spend some time with us today. I wanted to like have a little bit of a chat um, about some of the things you just said, looking at the images we just saw and how such a tiny part of the brain is responsible for so much and again the miracle of life um what how how is this going to inform um the research you guys are doing moving forward how we've looked at it so far is that we've started to kind of do literature reviews and to look at what's actually been done in the field of neurology and neuroscience around power and they're really to be such a, a major issue and something that we deal with every day, there really is not a whole lot out there is what we've been finding. Um, um, I know that we talked about some of the structures in the brains, but what we have not talked about is, you know, the chemical um, pathways and the neurotransmitters and the hormones, like all of that is impacting your sense of power. For example, uh, we know that when we're looking at primates, the alpha, the alpha male, or the, the gorilla who is like running the whole colony usually has higher levels of testosterone and that that has so much to do with, you know, their ability to be powerful. So I really think that we're kind of still at the beginning stages of really trying to figure out what are all the components, just mm -hmm. even beyond the structural components of the brain, what is really feeding into what makes us feel powerful amazing and on that point so what research is um already available and what isn't so let me jump in so what what the thing that has been interesting in this is that i've literally had to go and dig and dig so there's a, an amazing cultural neuroscientist at mcmaster's and i won't name him because because everyone will just be ringing him up to try and get info and he'll just be like <laughs> what are you doing um, so, so he's really a leader in terms of uh, power in the brain. And I would say that in truth, a lot of the questions that I'm asking when I talk to him is like, well, you're asking questions that I can't answer for another two years. So it's very much at the moment about taking where we think those re that research is going. But of course, we're then trying to do something very different, which is we're also trying to bring in lived experiences so and oral traditions and for some communities uh what is going in your brain may not be documented mm. um, so the reason why i i wanted to frame this under being a cultural thinker is that it's science but who's science who's dictating how science is done mm. how are we quantifying that but it does ultimately stem back for me to what joy was talking about what are the neurons doing? What are the chemical pathways doing? And really importantly, you know, people often say, what do I want out of this? What I want is really simple. First of all, I want, you know, wherever I work, I want people to understand that maybe their behaviours, if they're in power, may not just be as kind of random as they think. I also want people to understand, and especially groups and communities, and especially for me, um, the, the black and brown community, where we don't have power. And let's not pretend that we don't. Um, there are specific places and sites in the world, but we are very powerful. But where we don't, or where we feel we don't, what is going on in our brain? How useful would it be to know that X, Y, and Z is happening? Now, in the same way that, you know, me and my weight is a constant conversation i won't say battle and imagine if i didn't know that eating sugar makes me like a five-year-old and put on weight right that means i don't have power i don't have knowledge over what's going mm -hmm. on and what i'm hoping for neurology of power is that we can begin to understand 
in a really positive and productive way what we can learn from how our brain works just to give us the life that we all want to lead thank you so much on that and i i think that's just so important to amplify that the absence of knowledge is what has made us cling on to the science that's been given to us or the conversations around power and its legitimacy that we've um encountered throughout our lives um you brought up the point of like racism and how I guess sometimes the structural and systemic nature of it can make us feel as if we're powerless when really we know that as a global majority um, we are far from powerless but I just wanted to talk about how what the effect that continual rehashing of trauma has on the brain and I know we've seen a lot of that with petitions to stop people who have been killed at the hands of the state um, to, for those to be taken off of online and um, just how when we're triggered um, by those things and by those events, our brain is affected. And I wondered if um, either of you could speak to what might be happening um, or a little bit of the science that can so often blindside us when we're talking about racism and the brain. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so I think what you end up seeing is that when people, a group of people, or even an individual is held down for a certain period of time, their brain is conditioned to feel that that's where they should be in life. And they, they stop kind of fighting and striving or even dreaming mm. towards things bigger than their present moment. They're really kind of more geared towards survival. Um, I saw an interesting picture the other day of a horse it's a horse that is like tied to a plastic like some little plastic here but the horse will not is not moving because for so long the horse was tied to something much heavier and it couldn't it tried to get away and it couldn't get away so now the owner can just tie it to a plastic chair and the horse will stay put and i think that that's kind of what happens to the brain of of you know traumatized people who have been colonialized or have been subject to racism is that we start to feel that we are not capable of doing certain things you know the the structure has set things up in a place where in a sense where we feel like we can't go any higher than this we can't go any further than our communities or our block we can't dream of what will happen 10 years ago because we're really just trying to get through Today, I don't know if I'm going to be stopped on my way home from work and, and killed. So how am I thinking about what's going to happen in 10 years? So that all affects the brain. I think at the point where people stop dreaming, that is really the saddest part of it for me. Because so much happens when we dream. You know, and I talk to people in my psychiatric work all the time when I'm asking them about their dreams and their hopes and and they're, they're like, well, I don't really understand what you're talking about. Like, I don't, I mean, I have nightmares. I have PTSD. Mm. But I don't know that I really dream too much about the possibility of life. Um, mm. And power is so closely tied to that. The ability to dream and think beyond your current situation is so key to feeling powerful. Mm. 100% and like not only does it have that psychological effect but also in terms of um, our life chances are definitely limited by it. Um, when I was facilitating and doing diversity and inclusion workshops um, I was constantly working with people who were in positions of power um, within their working organisation and the level of like dissonance was astounding but one of the um activities we did to really drum down the effect of a culmination of microaggressions or of structural um and consistent traumas was the fact that if we look at how being in a state of anxiety highs our cortisol levels and how when we have a higher cortisol levels we're tense and something i'm always saying is drop your shoulders to just be aware of what's happening in our body but a higher cortisol level can actually lead to a lower life expectancy if we continue to be in those states uh, time and time again and it was one of those things that every time we mentioned it to a group it would always get questioned of like oh well is that true microaggressions can't have that level of power or effect over us but 
we've actually seen it from not only the statistics in the UK, but also in the US of being in these spaces and um, high cortisol levels taking essentially 10 years off of your life. And there are a couple um, studies into this, but it is literally a matter of life or death when it comes to our positions of understanding power. And so absolutely you are so spot on there because we tend to not we look at smoking and how that affects your life or you know drinking and other risk factors but really we have been negligent i think as a scientific community in really looking at cortisol and how just the stress level affects you long term when you look at when, when we look at health disparities and we look at um a black male and a white male who make the same amount of money, who even live in the same area of town, the black male still has a much lower, I mean, a much higher life, ex I mean, much lower life expectancy and much higher chance of dying from stroke or a heart attack because, likely because of the, the heightened level of stress of just being a black male trying to navigate the world. Um, I think any person of color can attest to just the daily microaggressions and, and really the heightened response from your amygdala throughout the day. You mm. know, I, it's just in my ride from home to work. You know, if I see a cop or I see a cop pulling somebody over, you know, that's already heightening my stress. When I get to work, really feeling like I need to uh, perform at a level that is above par. You know, that's going to add a, a, another level of stress or being able to interpret what is happening and what's going on in that environment or what my superiors are thinking or what my patients are thinking. Like all of this additional processing is happening in the in the mind of people, minds of people of color mm -hmm. that I think that other people have the luxury to not think about so much. You know, I think we think about it much more often and we and it really kind of brings our blood pressure up this is part of the why we all have high blood pressure and mm -hmm. are more prone to uh diabetes and other things um but they are very closely tied and i really i do a lot of community talks um about stress and how to de-stress your life the other aspect is that we tend not to um look into therapy as an option to kind of process these things. So we end up just holding on to them, mm -hmm. you know, or, it, it, or the stress comes out in different ways. We start to self-medicate with, you know, drugs or alcohol or food or sex or just anything that kind of stimulates our dopamine pathway so that we feel happy and all right. So these are definitely, this is part of why it's all so complicated, but these are the things that have to look at if we're really trying to dissect the, the issue of power. So just, just a little aside for people, I got I got a few texts this morning going, how have I known you so long and I didn't know you were a twin? <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it for everyone to figure out um, while I go back to neuroscience. I think, you know, when I started this piece of work and, and it is very centered around science, it's very centered around neuroscience, but you can't answer anything with only one strand. I just don't believe the world is like that. And, and that's why for me, it brings in, you know, psychiatry, psychology, um, and all the social science, but also it brings in people's experience. And the thing that I wanna share that my friend was talking to me about this week. So I've been working, as I said, with an organization that looks through um, leadership and power and creativity from a First Nations and Indigenous um, nations perspective. Uh, my, my friend who who would talk about herself as being part of the Yoruba nations gave me this beautiful, beautiful example. Now I haven't seen the film, but for those that have seen the film Avatar, essentially part of the premise is that everything's interconnected. And so your ability to have power is based on how you interact with the plants and other species. Mm. So me, that's what this work is about and that's that's why it's complicated because I'm looking at it through the lens of science but ultimately we're asking how, what can it do to benefit us and society and for me the world cannot be right while we need Black Lives Matters right and so this is for 
everybody on the planet. Like this is this is it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. Um, you should all be, and we should all be thinking about that notion of where does power reside in our brain? How do we use it? How do we share it? How do we use it for good? Um, because without that, we just can't move forward. Um, and I thought I should bring in one more thing. I've just seen some of the questions around does power corrupt? And I, and I, I can't answer that. What I can say is there's some research and more psychological research about something called um, personal power versus social power. And, and some scientists have it different ways, but essentially what it says is that if you are using your power for the benefit of society, you can sort of move towards asking the question as to whether that would have a different impact in your brain. But if you're using your power for personal power, for your own gain, then I'm curious to know what 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 does that do on the makeup of your brain? Um, so those are the sorts of questions that we're that we're asking. And I know you've um, both of you have spoken um, at various points, whether in this session or not, about how power changes the way that the brain responds to others. Could you speak a little bit more on that, and then we're going to grab some questions and comments from um, everyone else. So I'll, I'll start. Um, as I said, that there's a there's a significant paper that I'm looking at the moment, and really, neuroscience is a bit like politics, right? Sometimes it is not a straightforward answer. And so, what the research is showing is that um, the more powerful, and that, and, and of course, what I now have to ask is, how did they measure power in that person? But the more powerful someone is the less their empathy, their ability to empathize becomes. Now, that is really, that, that, those actions and those thoughts are housed within your skull, in your brain. And so the question becomes, something is changing in your brain. Hence, the Atlantic's uh, pop headline, power causes brain damage. Mm. If you go back to the neuroscience, if you go back to the person they're quoting, what he's saying, let me repeat it again, is that in terms of power, which is somewhere in the brain, your empathy levels, the more power you get, the less empathetic you might be. And therefore, that is essentially changing the makeup of your brain. I don't know if there's anything that um, that, that Joy might want to add into that. Well, in, in one of the papers that we were looking at, um, it, it links the ability to be empathetic to the levels of serotonin in the brain. Um, serotonin, and serotonin is a neurotransmitter, which um, really is, is linked to us feeling a sense of calm, uh, a sense of well-being. Um, and so um, it seemed that when those levels were off, people were either less empathetic or more empathetic. This is also the neurotransmitter that we target for depression um, and for anxiety. Uh, so you can see how all of those kind of like are linked to empathy and then ultimately power. Because of course, if, you're, if you don't feel em empathetic, if you can't identify with the feelings of other people, or if you're feeling even more anxious or more depressed, then that is also going to affect your ability to be impactful and to feel powerful and to feel that you're motivated to do things and to really express yourself in life. So that's kind of what we're seeing um, in some of the research, but there's still so much that needs to be done. Um, and I think ultimately, Suzanne and I have talked about really wanting to be able to give people um, some tools that they can use you know that this research is, it, research is not just for the sake of doing research and just kind of you know like feeling you know learned but you know we really want to be able to give people tools so that they can really tap into their power and really be able to carry themselves in a way where they can actualize the things that they want to see in life um, and especially, especially for people who have been disenfranchised, just really kind of starting to change the way that their brains process how, how and who they can be. 
Thank you so much. And um, the the point on like how the collectivity of how we then as people or people who have been racialized or people who have been oppressed um, continue to move forward, I think it's, it's just so linked to not only why this project is happening, but how we envision and dream about the new futures. And obviously this this whole festival is around reimagination or like um the importance of dreaming and so to understand and to have that knowledge like Suzanne said a little bit earlier of this is what is going on and so now now I can make an informed choice instead of just being on autopilot um comes within some of that collective um that collectivity and that like learning together we're gonna wrap up shortly so I just want to take a couple questions from the audience because we've People have been loving this talk. Um, we have a shout out to Michaela, appreciating the workarounds. Um, and Benjamin says, Michaela, love role modding, modeling, collective power versus individual power, power with versus power over. <laughs> we love that. Um, and I'm gonna go to one of the questions that I think Suzanne has already um, spoken to so Angela has then also said I'm interested in your take on any distinction between tangible power rules processes systems etc and intangible power personal relationships etc so I I think that um I mean there's a question around what tangible and intangible power is full stop mm -hmm. um, and I certainly think that during this period of coronavirus where we really had to look at ourselves we've had much more time to sit with ourselves we're really questioning what that what power is and and who power power by itself doesn't actually mean very much it's power in relation i guess to others and so i'm yet to look at what neuroscience will say about that like even getting neuroscientists to agree on their definition of power is actually quite trifling and hard, much less trying to think about intangible power. But if I answered it outside of that scope of neuroscience, then I think what I'm learning, it, it's about, actually it's about collectivity, this idea of intangible power. It's about what we can do as a team and a group rather than what we're trying to do individually that probably was a bit of a waffly answer it was a great question i'll come back again with a better answer joy do you have anything to add no i i think that you you've basically touched on some of the the main points but i i think that probably near the, near the end of our research we'll probably have a whole lot more to say about it um but yeah right now i think i think you hit it on the head amazing and just a couple more comments from um the group someone that hong has said um they wondered how a magdala was pronounced so thank you um nikki says i want to know what each of them look like i don't know what you guys say <laughs> Ooh, amygdala. The yeah, I, I it's also that translation that like the British accent messes up a load of things sometimes, and to, as do many other um accents. Okay, we've also got a question um from Shaheen who asks, I wanted to ask if there are any introductory courses you'd recommend to learn about how power and racism affects mental health and well-being generally and also for young people to specifically if possible. Gosh, so uh, Shaheen, thanks for the question. Um, I don't know of any, but but my my socials, my Twitter handle is my first name underscore last name. Just message me, direct message me, and I will I will if I have to create something for you, I will. And I'm also doing as part of my research. I'm I want to come and talk to young people. So if you have young people, let's just link up and let's have the conversation because. My research is iterative and so, you know, there are, there are ways that I don't perceive the world and there are questions that I should be asking that I'm not asking. So 
in short, I don't have any introductory resources. I can help you. We can put some together and they'll be able to be shared by everyone. And any work you're doing with young people, let's just do something together. Yay. Joy, do you know of any resources? I don't. I don't. This is actually as a formal field, like racism mm -hmm. and the brain is kind of new for me. Like I've studied, you know, effects of the brain in other, in other ways, but I'm really excited about what we're seeing. So I'll, as I give resources, I'll be sharing them with Suzanne and hopefully Suzanne will share them with everybody else. Amazing. And also just on the point of like social media accounts that might break down some of this, there's one called the Holistic Psychologist that has almost like a um, racial justice lens to the way that they look around therapy and gaslighting and all of those different things. So I don't know if those would be helpful, but um, I can also send a list of the ones that I keep up to date with in order to heal and move forward. Um, Hong also says, I'm going through CBT at the moment, thank you NHS, and it's teaching me a lot about empathy, which is fueling my activism against racial injustice. Is CBT where we should be directing our energy in dismantling structural inequality? Sorry for oversimplifying, quote, um, I want to know where to direct my energy effectively. I'm going to point that left to Joy. <laughs> CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is really looking at, uh, I guess, the connection between our actions, our thoughts and our actions. And I can definitely see how that will help us, you know, being in tune with that helps us to be more empathetic. I would say uh, for you, whoever asked the question, thank you for that question. Um, I would say that if you're feeling more powerful and, and, and being more empathetic to the plights of others and that's making you feel more like an activist and, you, and like there's things that you want to do now that you weren't able to do before, by all means, tap into that. You know, I don't know that there's any one route to, you know, I guess kind of dismantling structural injustice. I think that we are definitely going to have to approach it from many different aspects. Mm -hmm. But what I have realized is that taking care of oneself is integral to being able to, to fight any kind of fight. Um, so even whether it's rest, whether it's therapy, whether it's proper diet, whether it's you know keeping your stress level low or getting sleep at night, like all of these could be considered to be revolutionary acts and powerful acts. So you really kind of have to see what works for you and you can, you know, even reach out to your, your family doctor or your psychiatrist or therapist to help you work through it. But for you, you're definitely on the road. So I definitely think it's a start and something you should continue to work on. I'm just going to jump in because um, I know that, um, so for those that don't know, uh, uh, Dr. Jones, I love calling her, is actually in L.A., and is about to shoot off to the hospital for a 24 hour stint. And I believe that she has to leave in three minutes. So um, I, I really wanna fully take the time to say thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so she had got up at five o'clock to be with us this morning. And I think that, you know, that's a, that's a really generous act. Um, we'll definitely be doing more stuff in the future. Um, but I just really want to let her go so that there aren't people waiting for her in a hospital. <laughs> so that would just be <laughs> Oh, thank you guys so much. Thank you for creating uh, this form. I really am appreciative of it, this platform. There's so much that still needs to be said about it, but we're starting to have this conversation. And I think that it will definitely impact people uh, for years to come. So thank you for providing the space, for inviting me. It's been my honor and my pleasure. Thank you for coming. Thank you for providing the knowledge and um, the essential work that we need in the middle of this pandemic. And, thank and you. I appreciate yeah. it. Michaela, thank you a million, million times. You're like creating magic. Sometimes uh, you, you really do have to literally hold each other up, you know? <laughs> You really do. You really do. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Um, and just a quick point on Dr. Joy's last point around CBT. I think it's important to look at how everyone is very different in how we deal with things emotionally, mentally, psychologically, and so on. And so that CBT may be a form of therapy that is super good for some per for someone and not for another. And that um, we really take our time to figure out what works for ourselves instead of, um, I guess, moving forward and saying that everyone should be doing this. Um, because again, that's one of the ways that we don't look at nuance or specificity or particular needs. And so, as Dr. Joy said, when, when fighting this racial um, injustice, we're gonna have to come with every which angle because that's how these same structures were built. So in order for them to be destroyed, we'll have to have a multiplicity of um, solutions. But just within our therapy journeys, um, yeah, there are, very, there, are a, there are a variety of different techniques that suit different people. And um, I know a load of people who have been through CBT, some of them say it was amazing, some of them say it has cons. And so just to keep that in mind. Um, we've got another question from Nikki Suzanne, who says, have there been any before and after studies? Do we know to what extent lower abilities to empathize lead to success in climbing power ladders? No, I, I, well, I can't say no for sure. But what I know is that the research that I have found so far looks at it more or less the other way. But it's it's definitely something that we will include and kind of speaks to why for me this year about kind of refining questions needs everyone's thoughts rather than just mine, so to speak. Amazing. Um, just... A big thank you. I think before we go into the wrap up and some of the last thoughts um, from you, I just wanted to say a big thank you. And for those of you who are wondered why we said we're twins, we like, Suzanne is my twin, we are the same person. Um, and so it's been an absolute honor to be in conversation with you because I know what you're thinking before we say it. Um, but I wanted you to speak a little bit about um, I know we spoke a little like extensively about why you're doing this, but what difference will it make? So I think, um, as I said, I started this three or four years ago. I certainly didn't expect to be doing this research now. And it feels so important. And it will be very easy to perceive that this research is uh, specifically for the black and brown community. This research is for the world. This research hopefully will be able to ultimately provide a set of tools to everybody, to those that maybe have not, never considered their behaviours because they have power. Hopefully it will give them some choices to be able to look at themselves and to think about how they might want to change their behaviours. For those that have not had power, um, I want us to be able to have some tools that we can use and I want to give an example. I, I gave a talk around this as a provocation about at a, a kind of a sector conference. And we had some guests um, and one of them was a, a young guy. And when I was talking and I said, look, research indicates it doesn't show for sure, but it indicates that that if you don't have power or if you feel you don't have power or you don't have power over things that you would like to have power, that negatively impacts your brain and he literally i saw him do what you talk to me about all the time earlier he showed he just sat up taller and mm. in the q a he put his hand up and he said i think this is life-saving because i never even thought that there could be something going on in my brain when i felt so bad because i don't have the power of choosing a government or the power over my life or so many things that didn't feel he had. And just knowing that is that thing about knowledge. But I want it to be knowledge in a way that works for regular folk like me. I don't want someone to have had to have done a PhD to decipher it. Like research is absolutely bogus useless for me if it doesn't work for everybody equally. And so this isn't an issue about black or brown or white. This is everybody's issue because everybody does have power. Everyone doesn't necessarily have the power in the way. And, and I'm sure the people who may be abusing their power don't necessarily think it might have something to do 
with chemicals and neurons. Before we wrap up, I did want to give you another um, blinding quote. It's from um, Gloria Steinem, who is a feminist and an activist. And I'm gonna try and read it slowly without my slight list. It she says that power can be taken, but not given. Mm. The process of the taking is empowerment in itself. Thank you so much for joining us. And we can't wait to hear more about the neurology of power, where it goes. Any funding bodies listening, give Suzanne all the money so that she can make this work global. Um, because that's one of the ways that Suzanne works as well. This is never just going to be a very Western um, perspective. The diversity of the knowledge production is always something that Suzanne centers in her work. So we will be getting global perspectives and putting it into a project that, like Suzanne said, is going to benefit everyone. So thank you everyone for listening. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. What to Alia and everyone else. Lots of love and big up Suzanne one more time. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Bye.